Hi everyone, we'll start, uh, we'll start things off today. So firstly, thanks so much for coming today. I understand it's a Friday and Fridays are a hard day to bring people in, but obviously uh, the interest is so great for the topic of inclusive education and hearing our speakers today. Uh, Mr. Jody Carr and Ms. Kendra Frizzell are here from New Brunswick, Canada, and they're going to talk to us today about um, the inclusive education system in New Brunswick in Canada. Um, just to give you some context to, to, to Jody, he's a former Minister for Education in New Brunswick um, and has worked in politics for over 25 years, starting at a, at a very young age, I have to say. <laughs> um, and he really oversaw uh, the implementation of universal design in classrooms and uh, the introduction of quite an in inclusive uh, approach to education, which I think that not just Ireland can learn from, but other countries as well. Um, he has recently, however, left politics, I believe. Yes, yes. I retired. Um, yes, and he is going into a career in law. On my own doing. In law. law. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. I better, better make that clear. Um, so he's embarking on a new, a new chapter, uh, but yes. still working in, in equality, uh, yeah. human rights and inclusion. Yes, right. So we'd really like to welcome you here today. So thanks very much for coming. Our second speaker today. Sorry. <laughs> Our second speaker today is Kendra Frizzell. Uh, she has worked um, in, uh, as a school principal of quite a large uh, secondary school in New Brunswick, Canada for uh, over 15, 16 years, is that right? And I think between the two speakers, we'll be able to get a nice uh, understanding of the, the policy level decisions around legislation and change and that kind of higher level thinking uh, to, to actual what inclusion looks like on the ground. Um, and, and hopefully that the two, two, two talks will complement one another. Um, and I welcome you all to the School of Education here. In case you haven't been here before, you're very welcome. So without further ado, I'll, I'll let you go. Thank you. Thank you. But thank you so much, Joanne, and uh, thank you to the Trinity College, also the School of Education, for uh, having us in. Kendra and I have been here uh, all week. We've had a great experience. Uh, we love Ireland. It, my background, as was said, uh, is around policy and legislation, passion for equality, and it follows a tradition in New Brunswick, and I hope to be able to share with you a bit about a snapshot of what we've done in New Brunswick. And uh, everyone is different and everyone is unique and everyone does great things, similar to here in Ireland. And um, what works in New Brunswick won't work necessarily somewhere else. Um, it's a matter of taking your own situation and um, so we're not here to try to tell anybody to do anything, because we would not want to tell the Irish that in particular, uh, but it's just to tell you what we've done. And pause for reflection. Um, so the presentation will be some background on the New Brunswick Canada story, um, our timeline, and also what does it take to succeed. succeed. A few reflections on uh, what we've done, what we think we did well, and what we think where we think we could have put more effort in to make things better, and where we hope to be going as well in the, in the future. Uh, we'll try to stick to the timeline, obviously, to one o'clock, and we want to leave time, too, for some questions and answers. Um, National Council of Special Education, Teresa Griffin and Mary Byrne, they um, had come to New Brunswick. I had met Teresa in uh, Dubai for an inclusive education conference. They, I told her about New Brunswick and about our schools, and uh, she said, she first said she didn't believe me, but then she didn't want to suggest harshly that she didn't believe me. So then she said, no, no, it's just that it was hard to believe. So I thought that was nice. That was good. Because she did say I was a politician then, she thought that I was exaggerating. And I said, don't call it, I don't know about Ireland, but our politicians never do that. So she said they needed to come to see, they needed to see it to believe it. And they were here, they were in New Brunswick last uh, November and came to see it. And one of the schools they visited was Kendra's. And in six or seven other schools, they visited our department, and um, they had a good week there. Then they said, well, can you come over and meet our council? And uh, we have eight incoming new members to our council, and we want three of you to come from the department, from the school level, and from the policy political level, and give that perspective as um, if you can. And Kim Karakov was here as well. She had to leave this morning early, but uh, she was from the department. <coughs> but um, um, but I brought Kendra today too because I think that real life on the ground from an educator and administrator perspective much more credible than the politician talking head. And it is really the system that does the work. Um, that you've already heard about me, um, 19 years elected, I'm a recovering politician. Uh, thank you. Thank you for being part of my recovery. Um, 
I, I have days where I'm still in cold sweats, but uh, but I, I think I can make it through. Um, inclusive education has been a staple throughout New Brunswick for, well, I'll show you the timeline 100 years in our evolution towards that. Policy 322, I was the minister starting in 2010, and we wanted to narrow our practice, but we had legislation since 86, not policy, so we wanted to ingrain it in policy. We also had the CRPD, the Conventional Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and uh, we wanted to make sure that our new policy was in line with that, which we had signed in Canada and ratified since 2010. So I come in as minister in 2010, and then by 2013 we put our new policy, and it received an international award in 2016 under the Zero Project um, program. Integrated service is another area that we've received national recognition for our work in taking four government departments. It's probably, again, not like that in Ireland, but our government departments wouldn't talk to each other, and uh, they're silos. One didn't know what the other was doing, but more importantly, families. We're going into four, five, six different doors. And we had significant reports that came out, uh, individuals that had actually died because of the lack and the gaps of services. So we turned that upside down and said, instead of six files, families knocking on six doors, we want one file for one child, and we have to turn it upside down and have the departments talking to that one file. And it's been a huge challenge but it's been a successful challenge and we're still now, we, I didn't pilot it when I was minister. The, um, but um, we piloted it and now it's been rolled out across our province and uh, we've researched it as well. The wait times for youth mental health illness has been eliminated in the county, in the uh, counties where we have implemented uh, fully and um, it's just a matter of, of reorganizing our services uh, not necessarily even more services, it's reorganizing them to be more efficient. We have had to invest more money as well in the pilot because you can't just switch a system on it. You can't change here and go there. You've got to have some incentive funding to make the switch. Anyway, we can talk all day about that, but that's, uh, that's been fun. And then the legal work that I'm working on now is part of my research is uh, CRPD, Conventional Rights of Person, on Article 24, the right to fully inclusive learning environments. And it's, uh, and I've researched and developed 12 essential elements to legislative framework and policy, right from beginning, free and public education for all. So in our place, our developed world, usually that we take that for granted, in Africa and other places, it's not a given. Uh, right to a human rights uh, statement. The next step, I'm going to work with the academia world to validate those 12 elements, and then we want to develop a lens and a tool where you can put through a jurisdiction's legislative, current legislative framework, go through the lens, pop out and say, uh, these 12, where are you strong, where are you weaker, and more than that, what's the suggestions of having the, the proper language in each of those 12 uh, areas. Or it can also be used if a jurisdiction is developed and is draft, um, and they want to test it, then we can put it through and say, well, if you want to meet that international framework. So that's my excitement in the next year or two, and I've got an institute of research of inclusive communities in Canada that's going to help me reach out and get uh, and get this to the next stages. Um, National Council for Special Education brought us here and I really want to thank them for having us and then Trinity inviting us in to give this uh, uh, as a piggyback opportunity to just give further insight of what. Where is New Brunswick, Canada? Just to put context in that, I'm trying to talk quickly because I want to leave time for questions and answers. I'll have to skip over some slides maybe. New Brunswick is just above Boston and New York. We have a decentralized um, education system in Canada, and it's devolved to each of the provinces and territories, 13 individual provinces and territories. The federal government has no responsibility for education. There's no minister of education nationally. Each province is really an autonomous, independent country. And Quebec, no, sorry, I won't say anything. <laughs> anyway. If you know our history, you know there's independence of search to be separated. We're all together one big happy family still. <laughs> but you know that is why the Constitution has recognized education back in 1867 was because minority language was scared that education would be engulfed federally and we would lose the local autonomy of our languages and culture. <coughs> so part of the negotiation was to make sure education was devolved to each province so that each province could, and that was part of the deal to come in as a country. And so that does mean that we're really, well, it creates 
we created a council of ministers so we could work together, and that's how we do work together. Um, we're a small province, 750,000 people. Uh, we kind of look at ourselves sometimes as a test site. Uh, we're, we're, we're small and nimble, we're, we can allow for innovative. We also have the lowest funding per capita, one of the lowest funding per capita of our students, student per capita funding. You might look at all this and say, oh wow, you've got a lot of money. No, actually I think that's probably been the impetus of change is being effective and efficient and nimble and creative and build capacity with the dollars we do have. Um, our results are, because these are questions that are asked, our literacy, numeracy, nationally we're in between six and eight on uh, numeracy, literacy, science, depending on the grade. Now, in those results, because you're going to Google, or if you haven't Googled yet, you're going to, you will be Googling, so I'm trying to cover up all the questions, as many as the myths or the questions, or excuses. I know. Uh, <laughs> and again, I say we're not perfect. You're going to Google and see not everyone, 100% everywhere, thinks this is the right direction or has been. Um, but our, res um, our results, say, compared to Alberta, we include all of our students in the results. If we have students with disabilities and some of them are exempted, they get a zero on the assessment and they're counted in the overall results of our province. Where other provinces remove those students or they're not even counted. And so when we are changing that though, which if I had known that when I was minister, I would have changed it because it's not comparing apples to apples. And um, besides the fact that maybe we shouldn't even have those national and international assessments, that's another whole debate. But um, we're going to remove that. So when when that gets changed, I think we'll have a big bump in our results, and then you know um, the government of the day will be able to take credit for all their great initiatives uh, for having that increase. But internationally, we 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 fare very well. We're right there with the rest of Canada. That's, uh, um, there are no special education teachers, no special classrooms, no special schools. Students attend their neighborhood school based on geographic area. That's a big difference. We have no so-called parental choice. Our right, well, it's our rights are for the child with inclusive uh, education, but that's just the way we've done it. It's the same as every other jurisdiction, but that's how we've done it, and I think that's adding to a difference of we have, based on geographic location, where your neighborhood school is, where your siblings go to school, is where all the children go to school. No, no exceptions, except there is room for an exception, of course. Uh, if you want to apply for an out-of-zone school based on, uh, let's say, immersion, there's a, French immersion is provided where numbers warrant. And uh, if you want to go to another school, you can apply. If there's room in that school that they don't have to hire another teacher, you can get accepted. But you have to provide your own transportation. Otherwise, the government provides transportation for all our students in their zone and students with the physical um, accessibility uh, barriers as well. Um, we do have challenges, so I, I'll, I can get to those in a, in a bit. Um, each child is promoted from grade to grade based on their age grouping. A child is held back from promotion very rarely and only after very careful consideration. All children of the same age graduate together in a year-end inclusive ceremony. Um, if, a child, if, if, you, if you have a stage in the gymnasium that's not accessible by chance, if we have an older building, then instead of having the child on the floor in the wheelchair by themselves, everyone comes down on the floor. So it's an inclusive um, graduation ceremony, just on a very simple basic. That wasn't always the thought, though. Um, practically, you'd say, oh, and then, but then through conversations and change and awareness, then we'll say, no, no. And this is just an example of thoughtful, intentional inclusion um, and universal design is um, meeting all of those considerations for each individual student. New Brunswick system I've summed up into three areas uh, that were based on values-based, research-based, and human rights-based. Um, values-based, you know, all for one, one for all, or smaller communities, or you know, we have, a city would be 100,000 people maybe, and then the greater area on top of that. <coughs> so I mean, they're not large, large. Toronto District School Board, for example, is 300,000 students. We have 100,000 students in New Brunswick. Um, and so they're three times larger than our whole province. Um, and then um, also I was going to say then, so, values-based, research-based. Um, we've worked on universal design for learning. We've worked with uh, Harvard on uh, action research for universal design since 2010. We've been working on the changing the educational practices in our classroom. 
and research that through best to, to develop the best practice. Also, we know the research when you have mixed ability classes and students working together. We know that the, on the higher end learners, uh, the research says internationally no worse off. Well, we know well, more importantly, the lower end learners um, actually perform better. We know that the United Nations, <coughs> so from a human rights base, um, a human rights based perspective, um, it's recommended by the United Nations, the CRPD, um, uh, UNESCO, OECD. Um, as the, the rights of the child, the different committees, the general comment for that uh, more inclusive settings based on the values of individual rights of each individual student is the best way to go. So from a human rights, we also had the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in 1982, Pierre Trudeau brought in. That was an impetus for change, as well as I mentioned the CRPD. Children that learn together learn to live together. That's uh, something that I say often, and that really espouses our, uh, our values-based, our human rights-based, but our societal values of, you know, when we learn together, we learn to look after each other when we're finished school. And we've seen this, we've lived, we've lived ourselves through inclusive <coughs> school as, um, as young adults probably now dating myself. But um, more and more, we've got people leaving our school system that are becoming our leaders that have lived in an inclusive setting, we would do it no differently now, because that's what that's what we know. That's why change is hard, though, too, right? Then, oh the New, New Brunswick timeline, you could spend the whole day on this. Some of it's very similar, and it would be similar to Ireland in some ways. Um, we, in 1834, so before the 1892, we had the first um, asylum in British North America, in New Brunswick. Um, and that at the time, I say, oh, that's <clears throat> very embarrassing, don't. Well, at the time, that would be progressive, right? Mm -hmm. But that's what we did with what we knew. And that's why we have to make sure that, look, it's not to embarrass or to push or say, it's just that's what we did with what we knew. And actually, at the time, that was progressive. 1957, instead of the Special Classes or Special Classes Act, we came up with creative language like Auxiliary Classes Act. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's funny because sometimes, you know, you'll hear about inclusion rooms, but they're actually the segregated room, and you wonder how inclusive is the inclusion room. So names and words are important, but I can't be critical because we did the same thing, availability classes, that sounds so much better. Mm -hmm. But that was in 1957, and those were private grants given to community organizations um, to, to recognize the needs of all students, but that's exactly the similar paths. We went to the private <coughs> sector. Our first study in 1972, not our first study, but I picked out that study to show that we've been studying this for a while, a long time. Our educators would have had a panel of people and these reports and reports and reports. But that one says mindset needs to change. If we're going to include all children, we need to, it recommends a change in attitude. Also though, at that time, they were using other languages like subnormal children, you know, but we've come a long way. But what I did point out in 1972 was change in attitude, which is fairly similar to today, I think, if we came up with recommendations. The school districts slowly start taking responsibility to identify students. The Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which I mentioned in 1982, Bill 85 and 86 was our first um, legislation that legislated and mandated our regular schools to be responsible for all our children. At that time, and, and the Charter was a big emphasis on that, at that time we um, closed all our private schools that we had, and we amalgamated in all of the students into our regular schools. We closed our large educational children's institution, and it didn't come without controversy. Um, at that, but that was a turning point of fork in the road. Parents wanted regular schools, and also I think because of the size of our province and the amount of money, the lack of money we had, we didn't have the money to invest in private schools either. And I think other countries and other provinces in Canada Instead of doing what we did, they put more money into the special schools. And then you've got built infrastructure. But that's a history that yeah, has to be considered if there's ever going to be changed because, you know, but anyway. So it's, those, these are different turning points that then results in why are we here today in New Brunswick? Well, that was a significant difference. We, in 2009, we had definition of inclusive education, which was really key in 2009. And what this shows too is different political parties. We had two main parties switching back and forth and back and forth, but throughout those successful political parties, 
all were going in the same direction. As I mentioned, 86, the Bill 85, it was a unanimous legislation in, in that, sorry about that. It was an unanimous legislation by all by the two political parties in the legislature, so all members supported that. Uh, but the definition of inclusive education, that's where we, our turning point was, our milestone was broadening the Yes, it was important that it was children with disabilities, but we, we broadened the definition to include all children. Every child has something, I say. You know, everyone's got a unique identifier. <coughs> but more than that, so it's disability, it's uh, uh, Indigenous learning, LBGTQ, mental illness, new, new Canadians, refugees, second, second language learners. And by broadening that definition, we get more buy-in as well. More people that say, oh, okay, and it starts changing the mindset. And it starts changing the mindset around the practice of teaching and learning in the classroom. And don't forget too that people have multiple um, identifiers. It could, be a, it could be First Nations with the development of delay and part of LGBTQ. And so, you know, you, we don't box people in our legislation uh, based on diagnosis, and I might get to that, but um, as I mentioned as well, the our CRPD was a significant uh, milestone. Uh, in 2010, um, integrated service, reorganized school districts, policy 322, and universal design for learning. Um, this is Shelley Moore, 2019. She's from Canada. She has excellent videos and excellent, uh, she's an educator, um, excellent ways, little snippets. Uh, feel free to, to, to search her on Twitter, uh, Google. Really excellent videos about how does this look and what does this mean? How are we thinking? about the evolution of inclusion. The first circle, you, some of you have seen this, what's really neat is the last circle, but the exclusion, we didn't have children with disabilities in any of our schools prior to 1957, or any type of funding. Then we had segregation. Well, we had uh, special schools, um, but they weren't in the mainstream with everyone else. Then we did integration after 1986. We had special contained classes in our regular schools, but they were still separate down in a separate wing in, in the basement and sometimes as well. And then we said, no, let's move to inclusion. So between that time and 90 and 2009, <coughs> we went with inclusion. But we know that inclusion is more than just being placed physically in a classroom. I'd go into a classroom and visit and you'd see in the corner a student with their desk turned with their back to the rest of the class, with their e educational assistant being next to them. Another class would have the same situation, but a curtain put up. I mean, about how much more message could that send to the rest of the class? So then we knew that it was more than just, and Kendra will tell him to talk about that if I let her speak. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if I want to go back home. Then. But then now the fifth circle is teaching to diversity, universal design for learning, all of this. You guys know much more about it in Kendra than I do, but the UDL model. But the challenge was teachers thought, oh, now you're introducing something new for us. UDL, universal design, is this some new fad? You know, we had coding and then we had inclusion, and one comes and goes, and now you're gonna do this. And it's really a tool, right, <clears throat> to provide support to the teacher and the team and how to organize your lesson, teach to the majority, adjust for the high and the low, when I just said that in two seconds, and you know, it's much more people do degrees on these things, don't they? <laughs> Research and studies, but. Easy peasy, that's the politician. Like, easy peasy, get the policy in place, and then you go off and do it, which Kendra will talk about that. Um, the, another important point, dynamic inclusive education is a journey, not a destination. It's not one, one moment in time where you say, in one year we're gonna do inclusion, and now we're moving to coding. Inclusion is about how we permeate our work throughout the whole system. Inclusion, as you know, is about taking a segregated model and a mainstream model and holistically merging the two. It's not closing one and moving over to the other, which you see in the first four circles. It's like dumping students and putting them into special classes, but keeping the rest of the boxes and industrial model the same. That's not inclusion. When you hear people say, well, I'll get to the next slide. But, um, so, but it's a journey, not a destination. So everyone's wherever they're at across the world. Big movement around moving towards inclusive societies, workplaces, but also schools. The CRPD helps that, and sharing and learning together in partnerships. I just like the slide. Well, a few reflections. 
three P's to inclusive education, because we like our threes, for one. Not necessarily that I'm tied to P's, but uh, <coughs> not many P's out there. There are three P public-private partnerships, but uh, <coughs> the three P's to inclusive education. I'm the policy legislative guy, you might have noticed. And I, I don't, I, I always, part, you know, how there's a practitioner who's like, oh, that policy, blah, 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 blah. Well, I think it's important. And it's important, and other people do too. I'm not the only one. But policy and legislation um, is key to the three, the three P's to success of the legislation. Policy and legislation, the Auditor General and others will say you have to ground in a parliamentary system, policy and legislation, that's what we follow. If we don't like it, we change it. Um, but we shouldn't really ignore it. That's in our, that's our court systems use it to determine. So our framework provides us, um, is important. Our process and implementation. This is where we always probably could do better. If I had to reflect back, it's bringing people along with you uh, in conversations much more, bringing relationships. When we have thousands of teachers, it's hard to have individual conversations with each teacher, but more time, more reflection, more understanding, instead of a top-down thing, you know, this is a new policy. But you also want change to happen too. And if you waited for everyone to agree, then you might not get anything done. Practice and support, right? So you know the research about practice and support. You can come up with, there's 12 or 10, 10, 12 different, you need leadership, you need support, you need teacher training, you need culture, you need all these things that, that's required for practice and support. Key teachers need support in the classroom. We've tried to reorganize our system when we've changed names, titles, and funding, and models of support. Instead of supporting individual students with special needs, we're supporting the classroom teacher to teach and support more students. It's being effective, hopefully, with our dollars as well. It's, this is not a mechanism to save money by any means. It's, you know, uh, education support is one of our largest aspects of our overall budget. So we make a choice. You invested in the segregated individual model or invested in the inclusive school support model, and that's where we've gone is the inclusive support model. I can talk a lot about it. Uh, the policy, of course, there's 12 elements that I've researched of effective legal framework. And I think I mentioned that earlier, didn't I? Yeah, okay, we won't bore on that. Mary said, policy and legislation is good and important, and talk about that, but we really want to hear from Kendra and how it works in the school. I'm trying to remind myself that I've, I've taken some of Kendra's time I wanted to give her, because it is important to hear really. Um, where did it go? Oh, this is about the legislation and policy. We eliminated all mention of special education, no definition of special needs students, no diagnosis-based funding. Uh, you will often see that, you know, you have 12 diagnoses listed to trigger funding. No. Um, we have a three-tiered or a tiered model of intervention, which is more than the three-tiered. That's another whole story. But we have a definition for common learning environment in our legislation, and that's common learning environment where you learn. It's not just the classroom, regular. We don't talk about regular classroom, the common learning environment, the playground, the school bus, the field trips. One curriculum for all children, and then it's adapted. We don't have three different curriculums based on the type of student you are. It's one curriculum, expected outcomes, but we also allow in legislation, because it's human rights law, that we have to personalize and individualize the learning plan for students and we adjust the curriculum for the personalized learning plan and that personalized learning plan can then trigger additional support because again not one a person does not easily always fit in one category you know autism but then there's so many variations of autism so you know that the presumption of removal is justified so the pre presumption is in the in the I was going to say regular in the common learning environment first that's the presumption for all students and then to have equal access to the same level of quality service, the human rights based. And then removal as justified and documented. If it needs to be varied, then based on the needs of the student, you can vary. It's not the classroom 100%, 100% of the time. You'll have lots of different, we try to normalize pull out for every student so that it's not that kid that has to leave. Everyone leaves usually for something. It's, it's fluid, it's flexible. And it could be numeracy, literacy, it could be OT, occupational speech, language, the list goes on, obviously, because we know there's lots of need. Working together, politicians and department officials, it's important. Teachers, it's key and critical. It's another area I think I mentioned already that we just continue to work and support. This has to be about supporting classroom teachers. 
and families and advocacy partner organizations, academic, university, um, all of the partners of education. The three working together, this took me a long time to be able to figure out how to do, so I like to make sure it's, <laughs> can't skip over this one, but isn't that kind of neat? <laughs> Time, Kendra's trying to take time. I wanted to do 20 and I'm up to 30, so. Um, again, what does it take? Political will, assertive leadership, teacher support, uh, three to five year action plans. Look, everything's not done overnight as you see in our timeline. Partnerships, very important, and implementation I've already mentioned. Sustaining, this isn't a one year project, this is an ongoing project. Catalyst for Inclusive Education is a project under Inclusion International, I'm an expert or a member of and uh, we provide support through the Inclusion International, which is an organization like Inclusion Ireland is a member for, uh, and, uh, for developmental uh, intellectual de development. This is what I wanted to say earlier. If inclusion isn't working, it's not inclusion. That's often we get from parents, different parents, from teachers. Inclusion doesn't work for my child. Well, what's happening? What's really, well, they're in the corner and they're not getting any, well, that's not inclusion. Or they're throwing a desk and they're hurting, well, then they should be removed under certain, you know, that's not inclusion. So when I say if inclusion isn't working, then it's not inclusion. Inclusion should be uh, holistic and safe and fun and fluid and, and good for all. And it can be, and it is. There, may you be the change. May you be the one who makes a difference in a child's life by believing in them when others won't. And that's why we're all here, because we're passionate about making a difference for children. And whatever way we go about doing it, based on values, based on human rights, based on quality education, we do it because we share that common passion of making a difference for children. And there's no better way to make a difference, as Nelson Mandela and others have said, is through education. So thank you very much. Thank you. She's Jody. a superstar. We teach Jody about talking too much, but to be honest, I can't do my job without those policies. So that's very important. And if I can't win my staff and my teachers over with creating that school family, then I can also lean on policy and my department to say, well, actually it's embedded and actually it's your professional expectation. So I tease them, but I need them. <laughs> so I'll be really quick today. Um, it is recorded, Jody. Yeah, <laughs> uh, so typically if this was my classroom, I would say, geez, you just sat for 30 minutes and you need a body break. So yeah, you need exactly. to get up and I'm not modeling. You, you would do that. Um, so like Joni said, <clears throat> I am a school principal, middle school principal, and I'm just going to quickly, I guess my job is to give you a little insight as to what happens when the government does go back into their office, and the department does go back into their office, and it's left to me to champion uh, inclusion, where I need to be an advocate for my teachers, because it is hard, but it's also worth it. I also need to be an advocate for my parents because they're nervous too, and I need to be an advocate for my my students. <coughs> um, so my goal today is just to give you a bit of an insight as to what it looks like, feels like, and sounds like. That is something that I'm trying to change in our middle schools because sometimes K-5 can be a bit more loving and take care, but as soon as you get to a secondary school, it's okay, fun, no, it's rigor and curriculum, and they're still babies, they're still the children, and they still need that and sometimes people are scared of me which drives me crazy so I make sure that my students are sent to me when they're caught being good. But we do a little trick with our, um, with our parents so what I do is I ask permission I ask the child hey how you? let's trick mom and dad so I take the picture with that and I send it home and in the attachment it just says dear Mr. And Mrs. Smith your son was sent to the principal's office today um, I hope this picture facilitates a nice conversation over supper, period. Imagine as a parent when you read that, you're like, Ugh. and then you open it, it's like, yay, coffee and good. So, it's a fun little thing that we do. So, Jody kind of outlined a little bit about what inclusive education looks like, and there are roles and responsibilities as an administrator of what I have to do. Plan, do, check, facilitate, create schedules for my teachers so that they can meet during the school day and not after school when you're tired. Or wrecked is the word I learned while I'm not <laughs> um, So quickly, this is just staff greeting our students 
We welcome them every morning. We welcome them outside, and that's an expectation that we we greet our students outside the classroom. It's just a nice check-in. It builds relationships. We do this after every break, so like after holidays, and if we haven't seen them in four or five days. Um, but because it's like minus 100 in Canada right now, we do this inside at a more meaning place. And that's just a message that is on our front doors. <clears throat> so what it looks like and feels like and sounds like, it feels like our students who are feeling respected and accepted. And um, my pictures are terrible. I need to be more professional. I don't know how to do PowerPoint. Um, his service dog. And you'll notice the service dog is in the classroom. He's in our hallways. He has friends, and Kermit, our service, service dog, is actually in our yearbook. So we can picture of the dog, it's one of our students. I just want to show you uh, some of my classrooms. Every classroom is equipped with a spin bike. And the spin bike is stationary, and it doesn't make any sound, so you're just sitting and your feet are going. And there's evidence on um, these best practices for body breaks and brain breaks so that children, or anybody, because I can't listen to anyone more than 10 minutes either, um, to keep moving. We have rocking chairs, uh, we have a reset room, instead of a detention room, we have a reset room. And that took a lot of winning over my staff because if they got in trouble, then they get to go play with Mrs. Frizzell, that makes no sense to me. And so I had to show, and it has taken three years, that, and I explained, yes, I'm taking them for that hour, but I'm regulating them. And those are the three R's that we work with in our province, or in our country, is we regulate, <coughs> relate, and reason. So you can't reason with anybody unless they're feeling regulated. And when they're regulated, then you can relate to them and then have those conversations. So I show them that I spend that hour while they got in trouble to regulate them so that when they go back into your classrooms, they are regulated and ready to learn. But it has taken me a while. Every classroom offers flexible seating, so you'll notice, um, Jody, maybe you can yeah, Van White, you, you talk. Um, uh, yoga balls, spin bike, spin trampoline bike. at the back. Where is that at? Oh, there. Where yes, down but there. they don't jump this way, I think no. it must just be yeah, stored. It's, it's stored that Okay, way. Yeah. there's the trampoline. <laughs> uh, I mean, bike. I don't know what the other day, yesterday. Yesterday, I, I didn't make it clear that my stationary bikes, I just said spin bikes, I didn't yeah. say stationary, and someone came to me later and was like, I'm dying to know, where do your students go once you put them on the bike? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what they said, what they said, we're going to do like, and, and she will get to results and assessments soon, because it's like, this is stupid, free for all, we bike around the halls, we have a great time, we love Mrs. Frizzell's school. But uh, there's a, a stand-up desk, sorry, Kendra. Yeah, and often teachers have like a, uh, <coughs> you can get desks also, so Rocking you can have your textbook there, but underneath the desk are just the pedals. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes people are like, how many people and things do you have in the classroom? <laughs> um, a lot, but desks and chairs do take up a lot of room. Flexible seating doesn't, so it feels better, it looks better, and it works. Um, there's lots of research on body breaks and brain breaks um, to help regulate so that you can take the incoming curriculum. Uh, what else do I want to say about that one? I think that's good. Uh, so what does education, uh, inclusive education sound like? I belong. I'm laughing with my friends. I get to eat in the cafeteria along with everybody else. <coughs> the language we use matters. And when I talk about the language that we use, something that was really exciting for me. Two weeks ago, I was in a professional learning development. And we always um, called our students who we had to modify their curriculum or modify kids. And we didn't mean any harm by that, that's just the word we've always used. And the new language that we're using is we do not modify kids, we adjust their curriculum. And as soon as that, someone articulated that for me, I was like, ah, oh, that is beautiful. And I'm like, and I can't believe I've been calling all my kids my modified kids. Mm -hmm. But it was because yeah. I loved them so much and I wanted to protect them, I thought those were my babies. Um, but now that's not the word that we use anymore. We adjust their curriculum. So the language we use does matter. So what does inclusive education feel like? I work very hard every single day to make sure that my school feels like a family because there's tons of evidence-based research that when you are feeling at ease, this is when you're ready to learn. So when your needs are met, so you're feeling loved, 
your feel your belly's full. We feed our kids too if they don't have if they're not coming from a home um, where they can provide that. So we do all that so that they are ready to um, learn. And that our school, our uh, mission statement is care, connect, curriculum. Well, about the alliterations, I feel like we're teachers. Um, but it's critical that order because nobody cares how awesome your lesson plan is and how engaging you are if the child doesn't think you care. So you care, you connect, and it's curriculum. Find like the three R's I mentioned. Or the three P's I mentioned. Or the three P's. <laughs> so it feels like you belong. So our students are very protective with each other. So in the beginning, we always feel like it's the adults that need to take care of the kids. But as adults, when we teach, model, and reinforce, then the kids see that, and that's what they do. Um, um, our province is a strength-based system. So when we do personalized learning plans, I don't say Johnny needs to work on his multiplication tables. We figure out what Johnny can do, so it's strength-based. So I figure out what you can do, and then I bring you up. And at the forefront of every teacher meeting, because we already know students can learn. That's not something we're preaching. We already know. These are the four driving questions in every meeting to make sure that my teachers are always talking about academic achievement. What do we expect students to learn? How will we know when they have learned it? And how will we respond when they don't learn it? How will we respond when they already know it? This is something I share constantly with my staff. <clears throat> when you know better, you do better. And that's sort of a forgiveness for me because I make mistakes all the time and I need to model to my staff that it's okay to make mistakes. We are not alone. It's hard. The work we do is hard, but it matters. <laughs> <laughs> so of course, I should say wrecked. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is me like a baby. Anyways, um, I just, I, I want to leave you with, there, and I know we might not have a lot of time for questions and answers, um, but if you take a school-wide approach, the teachers don't feel like they have to have 30 different plans. So what is good for one is good for all. So nobody's going to suffer if you chunk the work. Nobody's going to suffer if you put everything on blue paper. No, if you do one accommodation, you do it for everybody, and then the teacher's not feeling overwhelmed. And for children who have um, significant behavior issues, there are programs and interventions in place that you do school-wide, so it's not the teacher. It's a school base, <coughs> so that no one ever feels alone, and we are constantly working together. And this is just a quote that I want to say thank you to you, and for my students on behalf of the entire province, that it's a hard conversation, it's a difficult one, and it's hard work, but it's so worth it. Mm -hmm. Thank you.